Hello, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. How are you? I am still standing, I'm doing good, and I'm so glad to see you and hear your voice. Same here. Uh, well, th for those of you who don't know, I love to call her Mayor Keisha, but for this panel, I'm going to call her Mayor Bottoms. Uh, mayor Bottoms, you are the 60th mayor in Atlanta. Um, only the second black woman. Talk about some of the pressure that comes with um, that reality. You know, Angela, the past few months, really, I think have been the most challenging that I've had as mayor, and especially uh, now that so much of what we're seeing happening across the country really is happening, we, we become the epicenter in Atlanta. And it, 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 has, it, it has not been easy. And that's why when you asked how I was doing, I believe in giving honest answers. And um, my honesty right now is we're still standing because that's what each day is about, getting up every day and trying to get it right again. Um, but nobody said this job was going to be easy. Mm -hmm. um, you can't script what's happened really across the globe. Um, between COVID-19 and this movement that we're seeing happening. And so it's, um, I, I've been saying, uh, my, my dear friend Killer Mike and I were texting and, and he asked how I was doing and I said, the grace of God is sufficient. And that's really um, so much of what I'm personally standing on right now, my faith, but also being a woman and, and how we feel and how we think and how we see our communities and just merging all of that together and hopefully making the best decisions um, that are, are best for the people I've been elected to serve. I love that. And, and one of the things that I think is probably, um, and I don't want to speak for you, but I think probably particularly challenging in this moment is you're being um, forced to toggle between your humanity and your elected position and your blackness all at once in lots of respects. And as it relates to COVID-19, as it relates to what's happening in the city around um, the death of Rayshard Brooks and so many others. Um, how are you doing that? And, and talk about one of your most recent moments where you really struggled to, okay, should I be fully human in this moment? Do I have to kind of uh, tamp that down so that I can be um, elected Mayor Bottoms? How do you kind of go between those, those two or really those three realities? I think of something my mother always tells me, and she says, you only have to tell the truth once. And something I learned about myself during my mayor's race, which was a, a really long, nasty race, is that the more exhausted I became, the more authentic I became. And I'm, I'm seeing that reflected now. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, it takes a lot of energy to be something you're not in the moment. And quite frankly, I don't have the interest in giving energy to that. So all I am interested in giving energy to is what's before me and not trying to appear to be something else. So I think that's, if anything, that's why people are getting it unfiltered. And I, and I you know, I'd be less than honest if I didn't say there are times after I, I speak, I go, oh, is that really what I should have said then? Um, but you know, it's it's who I am and it's how I'm feeling. And what I know is that what I'm feeling is probably a reflection of what the rest of the country is feeling right now. Sometimes you're angry, sometimes you're upset, sometimes you feel helpless. I, I think we're all going through this range of emotions and, you know, mine just gets reflected on television. Yeah, is there a recent moment where you, where you said, dang, I shouldn't have said that? that um, that's kind of sticks with you right now? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, you know, when uh, after uh, the killing of Rayshard Brooks and um, a reporter asked me, I, I can't remember the question, I think it was how I felt. And I said, I'm pissed off. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I said it, I thought, oh gosh, can I use that word in front of my mother? Because she's going to see it. So, you know, I mean, that's the, the hu human side because I, I still think, wonder what my mom is going to yes. think, my kids and my husband. Um, but it really, it reflected how I, how I felt in that moment and, and how I still struggle with those feelings. Um, 
But for me, Angela, you know, my kids are such a center for me. My 12 year old asked me if he could go to the funeral with me. And um, he stays up all night now because he's all in the club quarantine. So he thinks he's a DJ. So he keeps <laughs> DJ hours. But he got his suit out, he ironed his suit and went to the funeral with me. And um, after we came home, he said, he was a, a good looking man and he seemed like a really nice man. He didn't deserve to die that way. Ooh. And, you know, that's my reminder that our kids are watching everything and they're forming their their opinions and they're looking to us to fix it. Yeah. And, you know, that's, I think, what we're all struggling with across this country trying to fix it. And the one thing that Mr. Brooks's widow asked of me was that his death not be in vain. So that's, that's motivation in and of itself. That's so powerful. You know, the, the other thing that comes to mind is um, there's a lot of conversation, as you know, around defund the police, um, which is, you know, a divestment effort from the police departments to invest in safer communities. And so often, you know, people, in the Democratic Party, Republican Party, somewhere in between, when they hear it, they're like, ah, no, we can't do that. But we never have um, issues when we talk about basically defunding Social Security. I won't say we, some people never have issues. Um, or taking money away and resources away from schools. Why do you think that is such a jarring concept for people, even from a conversation starter? So some people said they threw it out there and they threw it out there in three words, or Black Lives Matter, right? They threw out Black Lives Matter in three words. And even when folks first started saying that after Trayvon's death, it was an argument. Black Lives Matter just started becoming an affirmation that everybody could really support and believe in. So when you hear about that, to me, you, you are such an effective leader because you don't automatically shut ideas down. So when people start there, what, do you, what is your response to defund the police or divest from the police um, to invest in communities. How do you respond to that big idea right now? So the way I respond, Angela, is I tell people you've got to look at the sentiment and not necessarily the slogan. Hmm. Um, and and I've, I've been pulling up a lot of props lately. So one of, one of my props, is, this is my city budget book. Hmm. This is a really complex document. And if I were to go into my mother's bridge club meeting and I said, we're going to defund the police, they would go nuts mm -hmm. because they want more police and they want, they want to see police and they want to feel protected. But if I said, we've already looked at our corrections budget, we've slashed our corrections budget by more than half. We're reallocating our corrections budget with personnel to community-based initiatives because we're closing our city jail. We're transforming it into a center of equity and health and wellness. And this is how we're now going to spend our dollars. They would applaud that because that makes sense to them. And so I just think for so many of us, it's important that we don't stop at the message because sometimes the sentiment gets lost in the message, mm -hmm. but it doesn't remove the responsibility of us to look at these complex budgets and then to say, how am I going to spend my taxpayer dollars that we've been entrusted to spend to make sure that our communities are healthy and whole? It may not be from your police budget, but it may be a reallocation of some other dollars. For us in Atlanta, it's been for our corrections budget to try and achieve the same thing. And I think that we, um, I don't think either side whether you're for it or against it, needs to stop it, the messaging. I think we just need to, to move forward and get the work done. Yeah, that's, and that's another powerful thing. Again, it, it demonstrates you know, all of the breadth of experience that you took into not only your mayoral race, but your victory. So a lot of people don't know, but you served in every branch of the government as a judge, um, as a state legislator, and then as a mayor. Um, given that um, breadth and depth of experience, Mayor Keisha, you know that you have been placed on a short list um, for a national office, and I think very much so thrust into the national spotlight in the heat of everything that's going on. Um, can you talk for a minute about 
um, what it's like to have that kind of attention on you um, if this is something that you want to do. And by this, I mean vice presidency. Um, and then, well, I'll stop here. That's two questions. <laughs> Well, and, and it was city council. I, I wasn't, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I'm so sorry it, but, but still a, a hard job. Yeah, um, yeah. And I remember the first time I met Vice President Biden and he said, I used to be on city council. I said, you did? And he said, it was harder than being vice president. I said, it is? Why? He said, because everybody knows where you live. <laughs> so, Ooh, yeah. Um, and, and now that means people show up at your house with bullhorns at seven o'clock in the morning when they know where you live. That, right. That's what um, this experience has been over the past few months. But um, Angela, there are 330 million people in America. So to have my name spoken, even in this circle and, and at this level, I, I mean, it, it is a really big deal. So I won't, pretend that that it's not a big deal to me to have my name mentioned but what i've said from the beginning is i want joe biden to win and whomever he thinks is going to help him win and then lead and help heal this country that's who i'm going to be rooting for so if it if it's me it's something i would give serious consideration to and if it's someone else that he thinks is better suited to help him win in november I mean, there's so much at stake with our country right now and, and with the future for my children and, and our not yet born children. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm going to do and support whomever um, he thinks is best suited to help him get there in November. Well, we're not talking about all of them. We're talking about you. So tell me what, um, what you think um, are some of the things that you bring to the table where Joe Biden may have some flat sides or some places where you're like, I know that if I'm on the ticket, these, you know, two or three things get addressed. What are some of those things? So I, t I told you I've been pulling on props and this has been important to me. I did um, some family research probably about 15 years ago. And it's interesting, I, over the past several months, several weeks, I've been touching these documents because they're important to me. This is Shepard and Betsy Peak. These are my grandmother's grandparents. They're freed slaves. Mm -hmm. I've been told that he served either in the state legislature or in Congress during Reconstruction. Wow. Um, this is his slave master's will. So he has chairs, tables, sofa, cupboard, and Shepard Peak valued at $1,400. This mm -hmm. is... A document signed by Shepard Peak with an X. I'm going to assume that he could not read and write. Mm -hmm. And this is the 1870 census. He thought it important that he be counted. Mm -hmm. So when I'm asked about serving as mayor and, and potentially as a running mate and just even being a leader in this moment, I keep going back to this history and all that has been poured into me even before I was born that gives me this truly American experience that most people uh, who, who aren't of my hue don't have. Mm -hmm. And I, this is what I carry in me every day as a leader. I carry that I, I truly am the hope of the slave. Mm. And I carry those experiences and I, I carry that my father was a wonderful man with flaws who suffered with addiction and who went to prison when I was a child. I carry with me uh, watching my mother struggle to make ends meet. And I carry with me all of the hopes and dreams that I have for my children in this country. And I carry it with me because I live it and I work for it each and every day. And I think that's the balance that I would bring to a ticket with Joe Biden. Um, I'm, I'm a mother, I'm a Southerner. I've worked in all three branches of government and there has been no handbook for how we've had to lead over the past several months um, as mayors and governors across this country. 
And I think it gives you a balance and a perspective that the vast majority of people will never have. And when you think about some of the leadership that you've drawn on, we know recently um, in response to uh, just like the outcry on the streets, one of your things was, listen, if you really want change, you go and vote. Um, We know voting is a first pillar of, you know, building political power, period. But when you think about what is, um, what's happening right now as people go vote, we know what happened in Fulton County. We've seen what happened in um, Kentucky and the voting lines and the number of precincts that are closed. What do you think um, this country needs to do to immediately remedy um, the voter suppression that we see running rampant? and all of the challenges that um, voters, particularly voters of color, are experiencing right now? I think we have to vote in such numbers that there's no room for error because quite honestly, right now, there's not a whole lot that we can do because we don't have the Justice Department on our side. We don't even have a neutral Justice Department that exists right now. We don't have statewide elected Secretary of States in so many states who care about voter suppression and and even acknowledge that it's their responsibility to fix it. Mm -hmm. So be that as it may, we are where we are, but I think it's also on us not to allow there to be room for error. So we're we're not looking at 2016 where we're losing states by 10,000 votes because people aren't showing up in the numbers that we know that they can show up. I think people have to register to vote and I think they have to show up to vote. And my, my call to action um, has been just reflecting on George Floyd and almost nine minutes that the knee was on his neck. Register nine people to vote, turn out nine people to vote, and then get nine people to fill out their census form. If we all did that, even if there were the most massive voter suppression that's ever happened, we could have our numbers so high that there's no margin for error and there, there won't be any questions about how elections um, have gone one way or the other. I love that. Nine people, register nine people to vote, bring nine people to vote with you if you have a Sprinter van. If not, make sure they all turn out and then making sure that nine of us fill out our census. That's wonderful, Mayor Keisha. I know we haven't um, talked as much about coronavirus, and I, and I don't want to um, end this panel without doing that. So I just want to know what the greatest lesson um, coronavirus has taught you so far. Oh, gosh, not to take anything for granted. Mm-hmm. That literally in the blink of an eye, everything that you know to be true and to be normal uh, is, is no longer so. And I think more than anything, coronavirus, really, we peel back these layers that we know exist. Even as, as I sit in my home, there is a 10-year life expectancy difference between someone living at my address and someone living on the other side of town, not even 10 miles away from my home. And I think that's what's been exposed during coronavirus. So I think the biggest lesson is we can't just keep talking about uh, these systemic health disparities and how they impact our communities, that we actually have to do something about it. Because in Georgia, we saw the number spike with African Americans. We are now seeing the same spike uh, with the Latino community. And what it shows to me is anybody who's vulnerable right now Mm -hmm. is going to be susceptible to dying of COVID-19. And and whether it's COVID-19 or the next wave of something that may come, then we've got to, we have to be prepared. And the best way to be prepared is not to just to respond to that thing, but to have a healthy, to have healthy communities that can withstand the storm. The one thing that um, stood out to me in looking at your bio is you went to Frederick Douglass High School. And we're in this conversation right now around the importance of substantive versus symbolic change. And there's been a ton of discussion around Confederate uh, monuments and Confederate flags and all of this. Do you think that it it makes a notable difference for a Black child to go to a high school named after Frederick Douglass 
versus a high school named after Robert E. Lee or living on a street named after Robert E. Lee? Absolutely, it makes a difference. I mean, I can still quote lines from Frederick Douglass because they were, his, his quotes were on the front of every yearbook. If there's no struggle, there is no progress. Mm -hmm. And I can go on and on and on. And it instilled in, in me as an African-American child that there was some pride and there was some honor in this name that was reflected in the high school I attended. And if your high school is named Robert E. Lee High School, you're going to think there's honor and pride in his legacy as well. And so I think that we don't want to erase history because I think if you, want, if you erase history, you're doomed to repeat it. But I think there is a way uh, that, that you remember history, um, but that doesn't mean that you have to honor that history. And so I think that this is an opportunity while everybody is listening and everybody is speaking to have a real conversation on how we honor these things in our um, country's past that are still so very painful and quite frankly, insulting to people like me who can pull up documents and show that your ancestors were slaves. It's, it hurts. It hurts. And I think at least for the first time in my lifetime, I feel like we're having a very real conversation about this. And I think that we have to look at all of it. My, to the extent I have concerns, Angela, is that I think in this aggression to, for people to move down monuments, et cetera, that they perhaps aren't always taking down the right ones. And I think people, probably just need to be a little more educated. Um, but I get the sentiment and I think that we need to have a comprehensive conversation and a, a thoughtful discussion on how we move these things out of the public view. I thank you so much, um, Mayor Keisha, for your service to Atlanta, for um, the image that you um, hold and the ways in which you um, govern yourselves and make so many of us proud. And by us, I don't just mean little black girls. I mean old ones too, 40 year olds. Um, but thank you so much for your leadership and for your humanity in this moment. Thank you for all you're doing. Well, and thank you, Angela. The feeling is mutual and you make us all so proud and you make me and so many other people think about things often in ways that we don't even know to think about. So I'm just honored to call you my sister and my friend. Yes, thank you so much. Well, this is Aspen Ideas Fest and we are done. It's a wrap. <laughs>